Hang on. Talk about paying your dues from the basement of his house, taking slap shots at me as a goaltender to the alley by a house playing street hockey at times, even fast pitch. And for you young guys, we'll explain later what fast pitch is. Stick boy for the Blackhawks all the way to assistant trainer. Then he opened up his own hockey school. Listen, he was called by the Chicago Blackhawks during the strike and they asked him to train them, train the whole team. Unbelievable. Coach USA women's hockey team won the silver in Sochi in the Olympics. And now at the highest level of his industry, the coach of the Columbus Blue Jackets. Hey, folks, welcome. This is Baseball Hockey Outside the Box, the show that interviews greatest minds who love the challenge of status quo. Today, we cross the pond to the frozen ice of NHL hockey to learn how they develop players and how baseball can learn from it. Hey, this is my childhood friend from nine years old. Great buddy, a great story, possibly one day a movie or a book. I want to yeah. welcome my good friend, Ken McCutton. What's up, buddy? All right, Pete. I don't, I don't think it'll be, well, if it is a movie, it'll be about 15 minutes. So <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be a very short, short movie. But uh, no, Pete, uh, I always enjoy doing, uh, whether it's a radio show, which I've done with you in the past, and doing these types of things. This is phenomenal because uh, growing up together, we, we love the sport and we stuck with it. Well, one thing I've always learned from you is, and we were talking about it a little bit off the air, and we'll get into it, but you know what? You, you always like to have a lot of fun. So later on, we'll talk about the fun things that you're doing yeah. in hockey. And you can see it right away from your initial comment that you just love having a good time. And I think that's important, especially during these times. And, it, and talking about these times, you've been doing a lot of Zoom calls with 50, 100 coaches all over the country, all over the world. You've been very busy. Um, I want to get into some of the things that you've been talking to the coaches about and also advice you've been giving them about what players should be doing in, in these times. Baseball players have to worry about their arm, getting back to pitching yep. and all that. Um, explain a little bit of what you're doing. Well, Pete, I mean, um, these have taken a life of their own. I mean, I never dreamt that we'd be doing this type of thing with, uh, with the crisis that we're involved in. And I really think there's a need for this, uh, whether, uh, what, whatever form it might be. But with the hockey side, I've been talking to uh, – you know, countries throughout Europe, from the Dutch Hockey Federation to Belgium to England uh, to Germany, all the way to, like, even tomorrow morning, the state of Colorado, uh, basically from Denver. But Boulder is actually uh, hosting it, but uh, it's, it's from Denver to Aspen with every coach and trying to nail down as many states as I can and, and being on the line for an hour to two hours, uh, talking everything about uh, youth-level hockey all the way to the NHL and everything in between from parenting and uh, transparency between uh, uh, coaches and parents and that type of thing. Uh, I've had 11-year-old kids on the line, Pete. I've had presidents of hockey clubs on the line and past NHL players on the line. So it's been an awful lot of fun, but I think uh, we're needing this right now because we're starving for sport. Absolutely. Folks on Facebook Live, thanks for joining us. If you got a question for Coach McCutton, uh, NHL, Columbus Blue Jackets, uh, was in the Olympics, all that. I mean, he's got a tremendous amount of experience. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, the people you had online. We were talking, parent, it's important that parents are also on this line because it's an education for parents they, so they can understand how to prepare, help their kids prepare for all this. Well, I like what a lot of these hosts are doing. They're, they're, they're putting – they're putting on certain parents to represent certain clubs, parents representing certain teams. I like one I did the other day. I had a dear friend who coaches one of the top-notch uh, AAA girls teams here in Illinois, and these are U16 girls. And uh, I had every single one of those girls on the line with every one of their parents. So uh, these Zoom calls taking uh, you know up to 50. So it was terrific. So you had a couple of coaches and all the players and the kids and you know, we talked about development all the way to uh, I, one of the questions that I absolutely loved from one of the girls last week was what, what are what are colleges looking for? And uh, are they looking for somebody just beyond talent? And are they looking for somebody as a, as a person that lives well, is what, good, good in school, all the above? So questions like that. This is what's bringing us to this uh, type of form. And the bottom line, Pete, you and I can transfer these ideas from sport to sport. And it just doesn't pertain to hockey. It's your game, too, at baseball. Absolutely. And, folks, I have my Columbus Blue Jackets hat on. It's a cool hat, man. I like uh, that, Pete. Yeah, I bet these sub big time because they're pretty neat looking. It's a good-looking hat. I want to share something, Pete, about you and I 
kicking off at one year ago. Yeah. <laughs> that's you and I. That's you and I at Wrigley Field. Absolutely. And, Great time. And that, this is a precious piece, and I had it by my feet on purpose so I can share it with everybody. But uh, I had never stood behind home plate at Wrigley, and here that we grew up together, you know, literally what, 12 miles away from Wrigley Field at the most? Yep. And uh, to be able to stand at home plate, uh, and look out at that, man, did I become a 10-year-old right away. So that was a special day that you gave me. You know, that surprised me in, in a little bit, uh, but it was interesting because here's an NHL coach and you're on Wrigley Field. You would have thought, ah, it's just another park. But no, it is a special park. No, that was, uh, that was like being at a baseball church or a cathedral. <laughs> and uh, um, it looked very, very small to me, which we know that, you know, it's not the largest park, but uh, – I mean, childhood for, uh, memories were just uh, coming back to me, whether it was watching WGN or actually being at the park as a kid. But uh, that was a special day. We had a lot of fun, and I, I, hope, uh, I hope they can get back at it very, very soon. Absolutely. Uh, Kenny, listen, the, uh, a lot of young kids, you know, they're, obviously they're itching to get, get to play hockey a little bit. We don't know when it's going to open up. Of course, we're talking about in the U.S. and around the world, so it could open up at different times. What's the concern and what should young kids be focusing on um, as far as any kind of training at home in their backyard, uh, anything they should be doing? What's the concern about getting them on the hock, you know, on the rink? But, and then how fast do you get them on the rink when it comes to competition? Well, the big thing, Pete, as we know, I mean, you're not seeing even a basketball game in your neighborhood because kids aren't allowed to play with one another. But that kid can still shoot baskets. Well, that kid can still shoot a puck. That 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 kid can play with his brother in the backyard playing catch. But on the hockey side, uh, I'm really really stressing for them to get on their bike in the neighborhood and spin their bike. Mm. Uh, if they don't have a stationary bike to ride, uh, they have to get on their regular bicycle and get their helmet on and uh, tool throughout the neighborhood every single day to get to keep their skating legs. When it comes to uh, stick handling. Um, something so simple that I'm still doing for my hands. So when we get back to it, that I'm ready and I'm prepared as a coach, but uh, I like stick handling a puck. Then I go to a street hockey ball, which is the orange ball. Then I go to a golf ball. And what I do, Pete, is I look straight out. I do it outside and I look at all the houses. I watch people walking by and I'm creating hand speed. I'm going slower with a puck on concrete or on a plastic board then I get to a street hockey ball. Now my hands are going a little quicker than a golf ball, which is nearly the weight of a puck. Mm -hmm. Now my hands are really, really going. So I stick handle basically from 10 to two out in front of me. Then I stick handle on my side, which would be my forehand side. And then I stick handle on my backhand side. But my vision is always out. I'm always looking out, never looking down. So simple things like that are huge. Uh, kids that are a little bit older, and uh, they had the training uh, throughout their whole life and are now making a turn as far as advancing in the game, uh, especially 14, 15 year olds. Obviously, I'm telling them they have to train as much as they can to keep tone with their weights, but not kids that are six, seven, eight, nine years old, none of that. I'm looking at 14 and above good, solid athletes in the game. They got to be weightlifting, and you know, that, that's a must for sure. They have to keep uh, tone and be strong. But, uh, Pete, there's an awful lot. I mean, if you get a hockey net or just a, a blank wall, you can put a piece of tape, four by six, which would be your net, and just shoot balls at it, shoot pucks at it, or pass with your brother or pass with the neighbor. Guess what? We're talking about being six feet away. If you and I were passing in the driveway, we could be 25 feet away. Guess what? We're not going to have any problems. Absolutely. How about your NHL players? I was thinking about that. Your players right now, you're getting online with them. What are you talking about? What are you discussing? Or is it just you're doing a comedy show for them, keep them loose a little bit? <laughs> well, Pete, that, that's a great question. As far as any kind of communication and uh, keeping up on the players, no. I mean, the odd hello and that type of thing. And, you know, you might have a player that had a baby born and you obviously make a call or put it in text. But, um, no, uh, the thing that we're, we're keeping in touch with the players is uh, John Tortorella started a weekly quiz. And that quiz goes out at nine o'clock in the morning on a Friday. And the coaching staff changes up every single week. Like last week was my week to do it. I brought 10 questions to the table. And basically they were the history of the Columbus Blue Jackets or the history around nationwide, our main building in downtown Columbus. But the players 
they have to Google it. They have to get the answers in. The answers got to be right. They got to have speed to them as far as the quickest five guys. And the, the carrot that Coach John Tortorella is dangling in front of the players is less laps when we get back to training camp, whether we got back this summer or whether we're back in the fall. So there is something dangled in front of them. They, they, they are working at it. There's a point system. And the winners can actually pass on some of their laps that they are being credited for where they don't have to skate onto other players. Oh, wow. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of fun with that. So right now our, our, um, our collaboration with the players right now is through John Tortorella's speed quiz. And the Athletic, two or three days ago, on the hockey side, which is a great paper for every single sport, did a, a did a, a, an actual article, and it can be found on the Athletic from uh, I think two days ago uh, about that speed quiz. So uh, the writers had fun with it, the players had fun with it, and uh, that's how we're keeping in touch. Hey, uh, Tortorella, good Italian, another one. You know, they're they're <laughs> everywhere. They're in baseball, they're in hockey. Um, I know personally from talking to you how much respect you have for him, and he obviously it sounds like he's going to be a Hall of Famer. Um, but tell me, the communication with Tortorella, the coaching staff, what's going on right now between you guys and how you're trying to prepare just in case things do open up? Well, we have seven on the coaching staff, um, you know, from the video coach to the goalie coach to a skills coach, which I handle, uh, power play coach, five-on-five -five coach, penalty kill coach, uh, and the head coach, John Tortorella. There's seven of us. And, uh, um, I mean, throughout the whole entire league, everybody was so prepared. I mean, they did we all know life abruptly ended just one day or we are with COVID, but uh, um, we were in a really, really interesting spot. And what I mean by that is uh, we had 11 key injuries for nearly two and a half months. I mean, 11 guys out of the lineup out of 18 skaters and two goalies. Wow. So we really depended on our American hockey league team, uh, the Cleveland monsters, which is two hours down the road. But um, no, we, we had to have those players, uh, uh, be able to jump in, do the job, um, and they did do the job. And everybody came through on that young side, and uh, they did a fantastic job. But at the same point, we had vets doing that same exact job. We had goaltenders stealing those games here and there. So uh, in order to keep that going, Pete, there's nothing that we can do other than we know we have to get back to right where we left off. We played 68 games, and we play a total of 82. So we have to get back in that frame of mind uh, where we were with that team and where we were with injuries. But the nice thing about it is when we do get back, some of those players that we lost for a short time of, you know, uh, a period of time, they'll be back. They would be back if we started up this summer. Sure. Players that were out for the year probably wouldn't be back. We wouldn't see them until the fall again. But uh, we just have to say have the same mindset, Pete, as we did when we abruptly ended on March the 12th. Kenny, great on Facebook, great, obviously a fan. Nick Mikrovich, baseball guy, he says, great job locking up the goaltender and great job by the staff this year. Um, I guess you guys weren't, let's see, uh, the staff to this year, many counted them out this year, losing so much of their roster. Since you talked about that, if the season was continuing, he you lost your, you know, a lot of the players, some of the roster players, um, what would be the mindset of the coaching staff and, you know, and Tortorella to try to keep these guys going? Well, Pete, that, the, the, the Nick, if Nick is still listening, he's, he's obviously a good fan in order to know exactly where we, we were. Uh, Pete, we, I think we were up to 420 man games lost. Uh, we might have possibly set a record in the wow. 68 games throughout the NHL. So, I mean, that's how riddled we were as a team. But, Pete, the mindset of Coach John Tortorella is never to use that as a crutch. Players that are injured are injured. You can't do anything back. You can't bring them back the following day. If they're out for two weeks, they're out for two weeks. If they're out for two months, they're out for two months. We have to work daily um, with our culture, our identity, and keep that together, whether it's the young players or whether it's not you're talking about your team captain or the leadership group, the vet group. And, uh, but Pete, the dialogue, Nothing's going to change that way. Uh, we're we're a blue collar kind of team, and um, we 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 don't manufacture an awful lot of pretty plays. 
what we do manufacture is a hard work ethic that we bring every single night. And, uh, you know, teams that are playing the Columbus Blue Jackets usually know they're in for a good game. You know, um, one of the things I was doing today, I was interviewing Clint Hurdle, former manager of the Padres, or excuse me, the Pirates. Uh, unbelievable interview, great person. And, you know, one of the questions I asked him was, you know, in baseball, you've got guys who are on the bench, and it's not like hockey that they're, you know, coming in and off the bench a lot. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to keep them motivated and interested because they're on the bench. Um, mm -hmm. Does hockey fall into that at times? And if it does, is there something that you guys can do to, you know, keep those, the rookies, the ones just getting started? How do you keep them involved and active with the team? Well, Pete, I, I will say this. Let's go back to where we are, at, you know, you know, when we ended there March the 12th for three months, they had to be active. I mean, they, they were our team. That was our team. Um, Pete, I got to tell you a great story. I was talking to a, uh, an ex NHLer the other day and we were talking about, I, I gave him the story about where I really hit, it really hit home on me. We were in long Island and we were playing the New York Islanders and we had a morning skate like we usually do. And we usually have a split where the defense go off with um, Coach Bradshaw and the offensive players go, go with me for the split. And then we usually do a little post uh, practice with, uh, it could be anywhere between eight to 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And then the guys go back to the hotel, have a nap, return for a game. But it hit me during the post game drills that 11 guys were on the ice that were part of the Cleveland Monsters, just, you know, maybe at three weeks before. And I was looking at such a new group of players, a young group of players. We had a vet in there too, uh, Nathan Gerby, who's a terrific vet, uh, five foot six feet, 100 and, uh, 180, 590 pounds. Uh, he played 500 games in the NHL at five foot six. But wow. he's, leading, he's leading the pack as the vet from the American Hockey League. Uh, which is equivalent to your triple A baseball. But uh, man, it, it really sunk home that we had a different team. Well, you know, other coaches from our hockey team might have grasped that a little bit earlier than I did, but it really hit home on me when I was actually physically working with them. And then when we got back to the hotel, I saw them all around the table near me. And I says, well, this is really, really it hit it home again, that this is really a different team that we have. But Pete, they had to be engaged right from the get go. I mean, uh, First of all, they were, they were hungry. Um, they were uh, they knew our system. Um, we're very open with when it comes to our dialogue with the players and showing video and this and that and the one on ones. And uh, our coaching staff uh, does just such a terrific job with that. But usually, when a younger player comes in from the American Hockey League, they sit down with a few of the coaches and go over five on five play. Uh, they'll go over. Uh, face-off plays, certain situational things. And, uh, um, but we had the masses that were with us. So uh, there was a lot of teaching and there was a lot of uh, uh, video. And, but not only was the teaching in the locker room with video, we had to bring it out to the ice too. So there was a lot of teaching and a little bit longer practices in the beginning. But uh, as time goes on, we try to shorten those practices because we need rest too after December 1st. Kenny, I remember when during the strike, uh, you – we're training the Blackhawks. Got a chance to come see you. Um, 2013. 2013. Watch you, th how you do things. I want you to talk about, because you mentioned the fun behind it. You mentioned, you know, a lot of things about training I want to get into because I think it can carry over into baseball. We can learn a lot. But I want you to get into the training with the, with the Blackhawk players, how you set that up and some of the things that you put into practice that made it fun and allowed them to be successful at the same time? Well, Pete, at that time, I was with the Chicago Wolves, and I spent many, many years with the Chicago Wolves in the American Hockey League. Those were tough days. The day that you probably witnessed was a day where I already had a practice in the morning out in the suburbs with the Chicago Wolves, AAA hockey, mm -hmm. basically. I mean, you know, the, the American League, but AAA for your baseball. And then I would go directly, as soon as we were done with practice, uh, out in the suburbs, I'd go downtown, and uh, we were skating uh, just about a half a mile west of the United Center, but uh, uh, I was asked to come down there uh, through a mutual friend who was not a Blackhawk, but was 
on the ice. He was uh, still playing minor pro. And he says, Kenny, uh, there's any way that you can come and run these skates. And uh, we'd like you to take him over from Jamal Mayers and Jonathan Taze. Wow. And uh, so we, we know players are players. Players are not coaches. And um, especially at the pro level. So I'll never forget when uh, Jamal Mayers and Jonathan Taze asked me when they we met for the first time, they said, what are you going to do with us? I said, you'll enjoy it. I said, believe me, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> I'll come prepared. Uh, I'm a very dedicated coach. I said, if you don't like me, just get rid of me after a day. Well, Pete, we went from September 29th all the way to January 5th. And uh, so obviously uh, I got, I, I want to say I got 58 practices in there. Um, but the practices were anywhere between, I think, which is a great story, anywhere between eight to 20 players. And it changed all the time. So literally, Pete, while I was driving downtown, I had three practice plans in my head. I had a practice plan for eight players. I had a practice plan for 12 players. And I had a practice plan for 20 players. But I think the one that you saw, uh, what I think you were impressed about, I think we went to lunch that day uh, after the practice. And I needed a lunch because of doing two, two separate pro practices. Um, trying to bring fun to the, to the game, whether you're dealing with kids or whether you're dealing with the pros at the highest level. Uh, if you don't bring that, players are going to recognize that. You can't be a yeller. You can't be a screamer. Those days are all over. So you've got to be uh, disciplined at the same point and don't be a pushover uh, when you're dealing with higher level players, whether it be junior, college, or pro in, the ho in, in, in hockey, that is. Um, but if they recognize that you're like this, and what I mean by that, Pete, if we were running an hour and 15 minutes like we were with those Blackhawks skates, uh, I gave them about a minute and a half water break. And that was 10 seconds here, 30 seconds here. But there was no downtime. There was no players taking a knee. I wasn't going to the whiteboard and wasting time. Uh, we were going. So out of an hour and 15 minutes, we were going a solid hour and 12 minutes for sure. I know that for a fact. Maybe the other time might have been also beyond water describing a play, which I was trying to bring, or a drill, what I was trying to bring to the table. But um, bottom line, Pete, dedication, along applied with fun, and having a game plan. And uh, once a, we, we, Pete, you and I have been in this game as far as teaching for an awful long time. You know for a fact athletes can read through a coach when a coach is not prepared. Absolutely. Athletes can read through a coach for a coach who doesn't care. They can read that too. So when, when they recognize that a coach is dedicated, you're going to get results. So what you were seeing with the Blackhawks, we got an awful lot of results. And uh, um, that was an amazing year, Pete. Quickly, uh, they came out of the block and they had 24 games in a row where they got a point. They were one of the only teams during the lockout that was so prepared with skating at least four times a week. And they came out of the blocks, 24 straight games with a point, whether it's even though if they lose, they get one point and you win, you get two points. But they ended up winning the Stanley Cup that year in 2013 for their second cup in that 10-year span. Because they won in, what, 2010, 13? And then I think uh, 17 or something like that, or 18. But uh, no, no, 15 maybe. But uh, yeah, Pete, that was that was an awful lot of fun. I enjoyed that. Very memorable. And uh, it's nice to still pass, you know, through the walkway and see a Patrick Kane and have a mutual respect because he realizes what I tried to do and they tried to that what I tried to do for them as a group. And uh, in the game today, there's just a mutual respect because of that. Uh, invitation to go down there and work. Hey, you and I went to Wrigley, and I introduced it to a good friend, Anthony Posey, the hitting coach for the Cubs. He sh he says hello on Facebook, so I wanted to give you a shout out. You tell him you tell him to call me anytime. You, you're supposed to see me in New York this year. He That's said he right. wanted to see me at a New York Ranger game, and uh, my <laughs> phone didn't ring. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, he might have been the, – the, the thing I'm thinking – I'm sure he's going to give us a response on Facebook in a minute here. Kenny, I know one of the things that when you talk about training practices, um, you're not a big fan about – you mentioned that the, 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 the board, you know, writing things on a board. Talk about yeah. one of the, the, one of the, 
the better way to kind of identify what, how players are going to look at things, you know, how they're going to do things. What's the best way to communicate that? Well, Pete, I, I, we, we have to build our practices around our team. We have to build our practices around our players too, individually. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate that we, I bring the numbers down. You got 18 skaters and, and two goaltenders every single day, but I'm usually working with eight or nine players pre-practice. Then I take a dozen for, for uh, the split uh, every single day. And then you might have another 10 out there for post-practice. But uh, uh, Pete, the bottom line is uh, I, I think switching it up continuous for athletes is a key. Uh, if, we, if we can't go back to the well, you know, enough to change up drills, I, I just don't think we're researching enough or we're not building around our players. But we have to have a feel for the players. And um, Brad Larson, one of our assistant coaches, calls John Tortorello one of the best at having a pulse. So I say the word feel. I like the word pulse better from Brad Larson describing John Tortorella. So the pulse of your locker room, the pulse of your ability of play, and the pulse of where you are with segments throughout the year. And we know when after 82 games, Pete, it gets ramped up for playoffs that much more. No different than playoffs for baseball or the World Series. It gets taken to another level. You'll get baseball fans out there, Pete, that say, baseball is the greatest game in the world for playoffs and the World Series. And I don't argue that because it's ramped up. Sure. The players are ramped up. The coaches are ramped up. You're bringing something a little bit different, and you're bringing it to the highest level to win a major championship. But, uh, uh, Pete, uh, you know, culture is a big thing. Identity is a big thing. And uh, I can't say enough for what uh, Coach Tortorella has done in the five years that I've been with him uh, with the Columbus Blue Jackets, how he has changed the culture of that organization. Kenny, when you're working with the NHL players and, you know, it's early in practice before the season and you're working on skill development, you're trying to figure out, you know, what they need to work on. Uh, give us a stepping stone. What, what do you, how do you, where do you start and continue and then develop from there? Well, Pete, great question. Summertime, uh, usually after a playoffs or after a season has ended, if, if teams haven't made the playoffs, guys usually take about three weeks off, at least up skating. And then they slowly get into their skating, maybe twice a week, three times a week, very, very lightly. Uh, but once, uh, once mid-July kicks in, uh, they may be skating four or five times a week. Not still, not, not in a heavy, heavy way, but still kind of raising the bar by August 1st. They are ready. I mean, today's athletes today can't come to training camp uh, to get in shape. Uh, by August 1st, they are ready to go. And uh, uh, shame on the athlete, uh, whether it's uh, a minor league player, a college player, uh, NHL player that comes to camp out of shape. There's something wrong uh, because a player can control what kind of shape they're in, you know, every single day. It's no different. I mean, uh, my wife sees me working out every single day out in the backyard doing something uh, or riding my bike. Uh, I do a lot of band work. Well, my answer to that is I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to be a 59-year-old coach here in August. I got to keep up with these 22-year-old players and these 24-year-old players making millions of dollars. So I've got to work out. So there's no excuse for an athlete that's not working out daily. But Pete, by the time training camp comes in, the big thing that the National Hockey League tries to do, every single team, is raise the bar of their pace, their speed of play, to be able to compete by October the 1st, once you drop the puck, or October 5th, whatever it may be. But uh, yeah, Pete, uh, bottom line, if you don't bring up the pace, it'd be like a, a baseball team not having fast runners. Well, we know baseball team is still, the baseball teams are built on speed too. You have to. Yep. And uh, that's where that's where sport is today. It is all about speed and reaction. But uh, yeah, Pete, uh, players have to have to raise the bar from mid July, all the way by September fifth, prior to training camp, before meetings, and be prepared once uh, uh, once camp opens up. You know, during the season, it's very taxing on these guys. I mean, you're talking about getting hit. There's a lot of movement. I mean, you know, the lines. And again, I don't follow hockey a lot, but the lines seem very short. They got to get off the ice, come on back on the ice. 
where's the recovery period and what do hockey players do for recovery? You know, like in, after the ball game or after the game and then the next day, if they don't have a game, is there something they do for recovery? Well, let's go back to, you're talking about, you know, like shift lengths. An average shift length of a player is usually 45 seconds to 55 seconds. When they're on for a minute plus, that's too long. So when you, when you look at the shift lengths at the end of the game and you see that you won four to one that game and you look at your average shift lengths and you see that guys were out there for 50 seconds, 45 seconds, uh, that, now you can maybe understand why uh, you won that game because you were changing on the fly so much. Um, but yeah, Pete, uh, uh, we as a team by December 1st, we really bring down our practice time. And usually the first couple of months are teaching months and you're out there usually 55 minutes to an hour and 10 minutes every single day on the teaching side. But then the guys stay on a little bit longer and it could go to an hour and a half. But uh, Coach John Tortorella is big on bringing the practice time down starting December 1st. Another coach that it was, has been known for doing that uh, throughout his whole career is Joel, Joel Quenville, mm. uh, giving time off of, well, I should say minutes off of their practice schedule from De December 1st. And because it's 82 game speed and you're, and you're playing until the second week of April and then playoffs from there. But uh, our practice time usually goes down to 40 minutes to 35 minutes. And then when we're on the road, um, guys that are not playing will go over to the rink with me for a morning skate. And I usually keep them out. We call them, uh, uh, healthy scratch players that they're that are not going to play so I go over with the goalie coach Manny Legacy and we bring our goalies over and we bring three or four other players out for about an hour and then we bring them back but uh, the coaching staff will then stay at the hotel with the players and go over video uh, get them a little bit more rest but still getting them out of their bed by nine o'clock in the morning for meetings and then allowing them to have a little bit extra sleep so instead of going into rink twice we limit it, limit to one time. Yeah, I know in baseball, even guys like Joe Madden and some other co managers have actually taken away batting practice, told guys not to come till four o'clock, don't show up at one thirty for a seven o'clock game. Um, you know, because it is a taxing season. It's a long season for both sports. Now, I've known you a long time. I know you're very creative, innovative. You and I have shared things, you know, because I've always tried to learn from hockey, you know, what we can transfer into baseball and vice versa. When you're when you're running a practice, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was the skill is going to have to transfer into the game. So what does Kenny McCutton do? You know, once you've done, gone through the process a little bit, the fundamentals and worked it a little bit, what's Kenny McCutton do now to, to create that game situation so it transfers automatically when they see it in a ball game? Well, Pete, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I try to look at the players that I'm working with at the time. And I try to build around their game. Uh, I, I'm not there to change anybody's style. Not at all. And I think as coaches, we always go back to film at, at high levels. And it could be at the college game, uh, minor pro game. And we're always looking for negatives as, as coaches. And I'm the opposite, Pete. I try to build on the positives. I think about what, what made this athlete get to this level. Well, obviously, their skill set was so strong, whether it was their skating, passing, their vision, uh, their situational play, their hockey IQ, all the above. All those terms that I just used are, are basically terms that can be transferred to any sport, to be honest with you. So I, I think working around the skill set of a player is the key, and players love at the high level working on the things that they're very, very good at. Mm -hmm. But I do want to go, I do want to do, say this, Pete, there might be coaches out there that listen or li that are listening and say, well, what happens when the athlete needs a little help? Uh, well, Pete, it could be a thing where the players lost their confidence. Well, that's when you put your arm around that player. And I think I'm that right voice and I'm that coach, but I will go back to some things that are not working. So I can share that as another set of eyes. Because I've got the headset on, headset on for every game. I'm an eye in the sky, and I'm radioing down to the bench and our video coach. But, Pete, um, you know, the odd thing that you share with a player uh, is going to be received as constructive criticism in a terrific way. 
But if I was a coach that was always beating the negatives in and trying to get those negatives to be positives, there wouldn't be a, a coach player relationship. So I think where I've, uh, I've been very successful at every single level is being able to create the po positives around a player where a player wants to come to the rink, player wants to come to the field or the basketball court or to the soccer pitch and is prepared for the coach in every way because they recognize that that coach is prepared. So um, again, working around that athlete. But one thing I do want to share, let's say you are working with five baseball players at a very high level. If there's any college coaches out there or pro coaches out there listening at the baseball level. Um, if they wanted to disguise something for one or two players, one or two players needed something, uh, some type of help throughout their skill set and throughout their game, they can still do that, but make three or four others do it too. And the two that are having difficulty with it may not recognize what you are bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. So you're making five or six do it, but it might only be for two players or one player. And everybody still has to do it. And they can't figure it out by the end of the day. That is a solid way to approach a pro athlete all the way down to a junior player in hockey or a college player in baseball. It's a wonderful way of disguising it and making all the athletes do it, but it might be only for that one or two players. You know, I love it. I love that. And I'll tell you, um, one of the areas I was thinking about is, and I'm going to throw you a little curveball here. So I got a baseball. I'm going to throw you a curve. Um, yep. You know, a lot of times I use, you know, and I've learned this from Tom House, you know, we use the hockey puck to actually teach how to throw because when it, when you throw it correctly, it goes straight. And if it hits the wall, it'll come right back. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Learn that, you know, again, learn it from Tom House, give him credit. Great. A very innovative person. What if, you know, I've watched you, you and I played baseball together. We played, as we talked about earlier, fast pitch against the wall. Um, what, and you were a very good hitter and it's not like you practiced it, but you, did a lot of hockey work, obviously. What did yeah. you take from baseball or vice versa where coaches can take something from hockey and they can learn something to help them develop in baseball? What did you take from the sport or any sport? Pete, I got to credit you when we were kids that you wanted me to play baseball. Yes. And uh, I still thank you for that. But uh, uh, Pete, wh why does, why, I mean, multi-sport athletes, first of all, um, together is just only going to complement the sport that you love. So three sports that I loved, hockey, baseball, golf. Those were things, I mean, golf is an individual sport just to learn about yourself. But baseball, bottom line, you're playing with a team. Hockey, you're playing with a team. But uh, no, they complemented one another. You talked about batting. I never had a fear of batting. I mean, literally when, when the fastball came at me, was it any different than a puck being shot that I was trying to redirect or tip? No, it wasn't. So bottom line is a puck curved, a curveball curved. A puck got deflected and went end over end at you. Same thing with a ball being a knuckleball. Mm. You know, you know, th th a pitcher throwing junk at you. Um, bottom line is eye and hand coordination in sport from one sport complements the next sport. But I loved hitting. And uh, uh, fast pitch, you brought it up twice now. Uh, is a game that uh, for, for those baseball players that don't know it, uh, you use the schoolyard wall and you put a batter's box up with tape or you spray painted it on there and you just played baseball. Your mound was still, what is the mound, Pete? 60, 60 feet? 60 feet, six inches. Yeah. So 60 feet away, six inches away. You could still, it doesn't have to be built up. We play with anything from rubber balls to rubber coated balls and your box. Pete, I don't know exactly what the dimension of the box was, but that was that was the catcher. And Pete, you and I could play that for three hours. And uh, whether you know the ball went to this distance was a single, this distance was a triple, and so on and so forth. Onto the street was a homer. But those were those were games that we got better at because you just love being a kid. And it's no different than playing street hockey too. I tell kids to continuously play street hockey because there's no referees, mm -hmm. there's no parents, there's no coaches. And that's how <laughs> yeah. you become better. And yes. policing yourself as a team, if you're a team playing out on a little league field without any umps, 
you're policing yourself. You're picking the teams and you're policing the rules. What a way to what a, what a, a way to learn the game. A terrific way to learn the game. Same thing with street hockey. So uh, you're only going to get better doing that. And uh, bottom line is, when you do that, it shows me that we don't always have to be organized at the young ages. Uh, when you're six and seven to ten years old, it doesn't have to be highlighted on the on the uh, refrigerator what time your practice is guess what your practice is outside your house against the school wall yep. or it's in the cul-de-sac playing street hockey absolutely and uh, so that's where the kids can continuously play the game and when they take that to the ball field or take it to the ice rink and transfer that over they're only going to be better at their sport for it and folks, if you're on Facebook Live and you got any questions, please type them in the comments section. I want to quickly address one by Nick Mikrovich. Um, he asked me, but uh, he says, do you agree with no batting practice, Pete? Um, it's not necessarily I agree with no batting practice, but what Kenny said, um, he said, you've got to get the pulse of your players. And I think if you get the pulse of your players, you'll understand that you don't have to have batting practice every day. There's times where you have bad batting practice, you know, and then you don't feel good. There's times you have great batting practice and maybe you might feel better in a game. More importantly to me, are you creating the game situation in batting practice? I think it's good to get a little, a little bit of a feel, your body doing a good job, but eventually you got to create that situation where batting practice is a little bit more like the game. What do I mean by that? Throw different pitches, throw the ball in and out, up and down, different things. Just create that to prepare them for the game. It's no different than a pitcher sitting in the bullpen getting warmed up you know, do you have a hitter there standing there? Why? Because that hitter is getting prepared, but also the pitcher is preparing himself for getting into a game. So, Kenny, one, one thing I love is this. You know, you talk about street hockey, you know, getting baseball players to play street hockey, getting baseball players to do hockey drills, uh, you know, not on ice necessarily. If you can get them on ice, I believe that they become much better hitters because if you could balance yourself on ice and take a slap shot, boy, now you're on flat ground and you got to hit a baseball not that it's easy, but it could transfer to be a little bit easier. Yeah, I, I think it would work, Pete, more with street hockey because if you've got kids playing a higher higher level of baseball, they haven't been on skates for ages. Yeah, and you're going to get somebody hurt. So, you know, you and I have discussed this in the past. You can bring it to a gym with street hockey. Uh, but let, let kids play that other sport. I'm, I, throughout my hockey school, throughout my whole entire career, I was big on soccer uh, because the game of soccer is the game of hockey. It's a transitional game. So you have to headman the ball to get it forward, to go north as a team, no different than headmanning a puck. But, uh, yeah, Pete, if you, if you were able to do uh, drills hockey-related uh, with baseball players, whether it be stick handling, I mean, picture even on grass, Pete, a 50-yard sprint by a baseball player with a hockey stick in their hand and an orange ball but they have to sprint 50 yards while stick handling that ball. Think about it. Yeah. I mean, I just thought of this right now. I mean, I think it's a pretty neat drill. And you, you can have relay races with that where they, they leave off the ball, they leave off the stick, and the next guy goes the other way, that type of thing. But now you're creating a runner. He's got eye and hand coordination. He's having fun, and he's doing something completely different. Now, you might have baseball players in there that had a little bit of a hockey career and they had played hockey. And then you have baseball players that have never touched a hockey stick or even stick handle a puck or anything. Guess what? It's going to show up. Yeah. It's going to show up. It's no different than somebody's never thrown a ball. You can tell when somebody's never thrown a football or a baseball and then they try to do it. They just didn't do it. And, and you see a lot of European uh, hockey players that can't throw a ball because they never, they never yeah. threw a ball. Uh, most Canadians can because Canadians are good ball players and yeah. they've, and they've played know, baseball and they've played baseball. But, uh, but Pete, yeah, there's so many, so many things that you can do as a crossover to have fun and enjoy it. But that little drill right there, I think a baseball player should be able to do that. Stick handle nope. a ball on grass. You know, and I'm glad you brought that up about, you just thought about it because there's so many times that I'm sitting talking to coaches in the U S around the world. And as we're talking, we're on the field doing things in my mind comes up something. Wow. Why, why don't we try this? You know, and then we try it and it seems to work or maybe it doesn't work. Um, is there times in, in practice where you got away from hockey or you did something different um, or you just changed the practice up completely? 
Well, Pete, great question. I'll speak about our team. Um, we implement a lot of smaller games. And what I mean by smaller games is at the end of practice, you'll bring everybody down to one end, but it might be two against two with mm. a goalie. And we bring the nets down, Pete, and the nets are only literally 25 feet apart. And now you have two players competing, two against two against that goalie or three against three. So what have you done there, Pete? You've created a small game, but you've brought competitiveness to it. And bottom line, at high levels, guys don't like to lose. So that two against two or three against three, that is a great way to end practices, to have fun. And I don't know offhand what you could possibly do with the baseball right off the bat, but um, yeah, Pete, you have to have a, you have to bring that that fun with a capital F. But we do a lot of small small games. We actually even turn the nets around too, where the player obviously can't shoot right at it. He's got to go around the front of it to be able to shoot at it. So there's so many different things, and um, but coaches can Pete can educate themselves at the youth level. I tell hockey coaches that are coaching minor hockey and youth level hockey, go on the internet. There's so many terrific resources out there for your sport. And I'm sure the same thing exactly with baseball, Pete. And there's no excuse for a coach not being prepared at the ball field or at the rink. Kenny, a lot of hockey players, obviously some of the best from what I understand come from Canada, but now it's a global game. Um, in baseball, we get a lot of players from the Dominican Republic, Latin America, Cuba, you name it. And a lot of these young people and top prospects, you know, they're, they're playing on unbelievable fields. They're torn up. You know, the baseballs are different sizes, the ba different, different weights. The bats are different sizes. They don't have great equipment. Um, where are some of the hockey players coming from that kind of mirror that, where they're they've been so much uncomfortable that when they get into – at the NHL, it's like easier for them. It's kind of like fielding a ground ball on, on regular nice grass. Um, you know, I, I remember being in, I think, Sweden. The rink was a little smaller, possibly, uh, or they're bigger. Uh, talk well, about that. Yeah. Now, Pete, they could have been smaller if, if, if the dimensions could have been smaller if it was built for training purposes. But the rinks over in Sweden, for instance, are a little bit larger. A, a normal rink here in North America is 200 feet in length and 85 feet in width. Uh, overseas, with, throughout the continent, for the uh, countries that are playing ice hockey, it's 210 feet in length and 100 feet in width. So it's a bigger surface. So they have to adapt when they come over here and play North American hockey. But Pete, uh, you talk about the Dominican Republic uh, producing players. The country that the two countries right now that are doing a heck of a job the last five, five to ten years are the Finns and the Swedes. And what happens, Pete, is it is starting at the grassroots program with their modeling. They're mm. playing less games and they're practicing more. And uh, it just shows you at the young youth level what fundamentals are all about. And uh, when when kids get off the ground with the, with the right fundamentals being taught. And then the baton is passed from coach to coach to coach and level to level. Uh, bottom line is we still got to work on fundamentals by the end of the day, uh, even at the highest level. Uh, so, uh, but the Finns and the Swedes are doing a terrific job. And Pete, yes, it's a very global game today. Uh, at one point, it was Canada's game for nearly 75 years. It is no longer Canada's game. Uh, it's, it's everybody's game. And, uh, uh, it's, it's terrific. And you see, you know, see, you see things in spurts. Uh, the Russians were doing a great job, uh, for, for a short period of time. And then it kind of, you know, dried up a little bit. Now you're starting to see that happen again. Uh, you weren't seeing the Finns and the Swedes as much. Now you're seeing, you know, so many of them coming over. Uh, but they're also Pete coming over at younger ages mm. and getting adapted as a 15 year old to North American life. North American hockey, and it makes it a little bit easier for them to adjust to get ready for either university hockey, junior hockey, and it propels them to uh, to pro hockey. You know, interesting. You said that about the Swedes and the Finns about them play, practicing more, playing more games. Something we've been talking about a lot on the show constantly. Every time we're on the show, 
is that we're playing way too many games in baseball. We got to practice more. Science has shown it. There's enough research behind all this. We just need to convince the parents that are coaching that, you know, kids need more practice. And as you get a little older, that might, you know, that pyramid might change a little bit. You might yes. play a little bit more, but you still got to practice because you can get hurt if you don't. The question I have is both sports are mentally, you got to be mentally tough. Baseball is a game of failure, you know, and hockey is a game of toughness. I mean, you, you, you be able to be, you know, you, you got to be able to, I guess, take the hit. You got to be able to maintain your composure because you, I mean, somebody hits you, you can get pretty pissed off right away. What do you guys do to, to train on the mental side of the game to, to prepare the athletes? Well, you, you hit it on the head there, uh, you know, about the hitting and the contact and that type of thing. There's an old saying, uh, and, and, and scouts love it and coaches love it, taking a hit to make a play, uh, making a hit, um, uh, having contact to make a play. I mean, that, that's what the game is about. But, uh, uh, Pete, yeah, it's uh, – uh, the bottom line is it, it's so difficult – when you look at the game at the highest level with the speed, uh, pl players skating at 20 miles an hour, pucks being shot at 100 miles an hour, uh, the game seems to get faster and faster nearly every, every year, and it is. I, I don't honestly know how much faster it can get, but the <laughs> mindset, Pete, yeah, the, the mindset of the players, um, it takes an awful lot of courage, Pete, to play games at the highest level. We know that, and, uh, and we know that not everybody can become – a division one player or a college or, or a junior player or a minor pro player. Not everybody can do it. So when you raise that bar to, you know, major league baseball, major, you know, the NBA, uh, the NHL, the national hockey league, it takes a certain athlete to get there and, and the mindset of that athlete and to keep, uh, uh, I mean, when it gets to that point, it is a job job. Um, and that's where the coaching staff has to be able to bring fun to their job. Because if, if they don't work at their game and hone their game in and continue to work on fundamentals, it becomes a short career, whether it's three years or four years or whatever. Uh, the players that are constantly working on it to become better, not even a premier player, Pete. I'm talking about, you know, just right in the middle of the pack. These guys want to obviously stick around for six to 10 years. Um, but some can't do it because they get injured. Uh, some can't do it because of nerves. Uh, some can't do it because their legs, their legs are no longer, you know, the same. So uh, it, there's an awful lot of things that come into play for premier players, middle of the pack players and players that are just trying to survive at the highest levels. But uh, the mindset of these athletes today uh, all the way to the Olympics. I mean, my gosh, these are, it, it's, it's another level. When that, and again, because you mentioned the scouts, I mean, if, without the scouts, you know, because in baseball, as you know, just like hockey, a lot of analytics, a lot of statistics, you know, some scouts have been eliminated in baseball because they're videotaping and watching guys play and they do analysis of the, the throwing, the hitting and all that stuff. But, you know, the one thing you don't get out of the anal analytics, which I enjoy, and I think it's part of the game. It's going to make the game better as a teacher also. And that's the heart. I mean, you, you know, the judge, the toughness of a player, the scout needs to go out and see that type of person. So the mm -hmm. younger you see them, that you see them grow up, the more you understand that player, it's easier to recruit. Um, the reason I bring that up because in baseball, one of the frontiers of new players that are going to be coming out, in my opinion, yes, we know they're going to come out of Cuba, Dominican Republic, they're coming out of obviously, but is Eastern Europe, you know, the, the Ukraines, the Lithuania, the Bulgarias. Why? Because those kids are mentally tough. I've been with them. You know, they, mm -hmm. when they fail, it's like another, the same day. It's like the, it happens every day to them. I don't know if it's because that's how they were brought up, you know, whether it was through, you know, during the war, yeah. whatever the situation was, is there the next frontier for hockey? Are there players like that, that, you know, that hockey leagues or teams go after or look at? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you want, you want an athlete. I mean, we, we all love a kid at 12 years old that, that has that bite, um, that has that determination. And if a kid has it by 16 or 17 and wants to make and, and turn the corner and wants to get even to a higher level, uh, it, it's happening at the younger ages, Pete. So uh, I, I think we're seeing it uh, at the youth level. I mean, we're seeing it at 12 and 13 years old. 
does that kid want to pay the price and get better? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what are they doing? Uh, but I hope they're also at 12 or 13 still playing possibly another sport, but at 16, usually they're honing in on that one sport. But yes, Pete, to answer your question, scouts are looking for a player that can play a complete game. And what I mean by that, there's three zones in hockey, your defensive zone, the neutral zone, which is in the middle between the blue lines and the offensive zone. How do you play with the puck? How do you play off the puck in a transitional game? How do you play when the game is a hard hitting game? How do you play when you're down two to two, two to one with the last minute of, of play? Um, so, I mean, that's where leadership qualities come into Pete and uh, obviously scouts managers are looking for leadership qualities out of these young athletes. Kenny, we are coming to the end. This is awesome. Been a great show. Um, I know you've got a schedule also, and it seems like, you know, we're, we're at home, but it seems like we're, we're busier than anything. Uh, Pete, it, you know, this is, uh, I, I would like to do another one of these, Pete, if you'd like to. I mean, I, I'm opening up these forums to uh, so many different uh, types of coaches, hockey directors, uh, coaches at every level. So I'm all, all, always saying to the group, let's do another one. Uh, because I always feel that there's not enough time. So if you wanted to do another one, I'm willing to do it because I think there's so much to learn by it. And uh, maybe our next one, we bring in baseball coaches live and uh, uh, we try to get 20 baseball coaches on or we get some hockey coaches on and that can ask questions. Yeah, we can mix it up a little bit, but we're not done yet. A couple other things I want to ask you. Um, one, um, you know, during this time, what, you know, what's Kenny McCutton do to – keep himself sharp, you know, in what you're, you know, your training and whether it's your own physical ability or, but like you talked about that, your, your, the work you do, but as far as your knowledge of the game, what are you doing to, to enhance that? Well, Pete, on the mental side, I, we have to be prepared for tomorrow. I mean, you know, to get that notice, to get, to get ready uh, if we get beyond this crisis. So, and, and everybody's praying for this world to get, uh, to become a better place and get back to normality. But uh, Pete, I do study film uh, big time. Um, I'm preparing my summer. You know, if, if, we, if we didn't play and I was still able to do some things in the summer, like late summer for preparation. Perfect example, Pete. Um, we're, we're doing something as a hockey club where uh, I'm going to be bringing 12 or 13 of our players to Aspen, Colorado to train in the altitude by mm. September 1st. Uh, I'm just hoping that you know, we're, we're getting back to normality and, and we can do that and uh, everything will be fine at that time. But the Columbus Blue Jacket players have never done that before. So trying to think out of the box uh, throughout the year, I brought this up to our management. I brought it up to our players and I only want 12 players, maybe 13 players. I don't want 20. I want to keep the group small and intimate, but uh, I've got players that are all in and want to do it. So I'm preparing for things like that. I do work with two U.S. colleges, so I'm preparing uh, my, my, my summer, my summer uh, drills um, for those uh, organizations and those universities, I should say. And, uh, and then the one-on-one -on -one stuff that I do, when I say one-on-one, -on -one, it's usually six or seven players, uh, USHL players, United States Hockey League players, and I do the majority of that work right here in Chicago. And I'm usually busy with that three to four times a week. So, uh, Pete, I'm still, I'm still mentally getting prepared to have a busy summer and get back to the game. Kenny, how do you take things that you've been doing for a long time and ask yourself, is this the best way to do it? Is it a constant ask um, and you're, you're always looking for the better thing or the new thing that can help you and help your players? That's a wonderful question. Um, yeah, I think we as coaches, we've got to keep up with the times of the athlete. Um, bottom line, uh, where they come from, how they grew up, um, what kind of respect they have for themselves, and, and work around that player. And uh, uh, that, that's, that's a key right there, Pete. I, I, we, we talked about it earlier, um, to, to work with the athlete, to, to get the best results that way. Um, that's the bottom line in my, my eyes. But uh, uh, Keep, keeping up with the game by watching other coaches. Um, there, there, there's hockey coaches that, that are out there that say they stole a couple of drills from you. Uh, we, 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 Kenny, we were watching you <laughs> practice. We stole four drills from you. 
I don't call it stealing. I call it, it's a compliment that you like the drills and you want to implement those drills with your players. So I call it just borrowing them because that's all we're doing. We're borrowing this and we're trying to get better. But Pete, yes, I watch other coaches throughout the National Hockey League and I'm like, I want to learn from how they convey. I want to learn how they grab the attention of their players. I want to be able to see what their rhythm is like as a coach, what they, how they bring their drills and what their rhythm is like throughout the practices. Um, so I borrow an awful lot of that from coaches too. And um, I think, yeah, Pete, bottom line is we never stop learning. I think if you just depend on what you did 15 years ago, what you did five years ago, we can get in trouble as coaches. So I think we got to constantly educate ourselves. And we learn this way, Pete. We can learn from other sports. Um, you know, I've been watching this program with uh, uh, the final dance with uh, uh, Michael Jordan. Oh, and yeah. that's, been on e that's been on ESPN. And just to be able to see what, how that team won those championships. And it wasn't just one player. That one player made others better. But who made that one player better was one coach. And that's how you learn, Pete. So things haven't changed that way, but you can bring that to the National Hockey League. You can bring that to another NBA team. You can bring it to a baseball organization with Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan and that great cast of players. We're doing to win six championships. Bottom line is we're not here to reinvent the game, but we can build the game and learn from other coaches and learn from other players and bring that up to today's times. Kenny, two more things I want to ask you, and one goes back to the Blue, Blue Jackets. Um, and, again, you're going to have to educate me because this isn't an area I know well. Blue Jackets, when you rate them in the NHL, uh, do they get the most talented players or are they in the middle somewhere when it comes to that? Well, Pete, the only way I can answer that is, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it, w w we've been ranking anywhere between, you know, the, the, thir the 31 teams. We've been ranking anywhere in my last five years, or for sure the last four years, anywhere between eighth place to 14th place, you know, somewhere in that range. And that's a pretty nice position to be in uh, as an organization. Payroll-wise, payroll -wise, where, where do you stand? Uh, every, everybody, everybody's trying to, you know, be right there, Pete. Uh, but are they all in hockey? Are they all level? Like in baseball, I'll give you an example. You know, the Pirates, the, uh, the Brewers, the, the Rays, you know, some of the teams yeah. that are low payroll teams are pretty successful. No, Pete, it, it's uh, every, everybody tries to get up to that. I think it's I 79 it. million, Pete. Yeah. And everybody's trying to be up there or a little bit underneath that cap space for some room. But Pete, that's, that's another world. That's for management. That's not for coaches. Sure. <laughs> and, I, and I bring that up because my final question, well, not my final, but one of the questions behind that was, was going to be, you know, when you look at the success of the team, if you had to say why it's so successful, what would be the major reasons? Two, two reasons. Uh, a general manager uh, by the name of Yarmo Kekalainen finish our finish. I think he's the only fin Yeah, he is the only finished GM in the National Hockey League. He's so progressive, Pete. So progressive. His judge of talent. Uh, he started off as a scout. Well, he mm -hmm. was an NHL player too, but uh, just has a, uh, a wonderful eye for the game. So, I mean, it starts with management built around him. And it, it starts with uh, in our locker room with that combination of John Tortorella and Yarmo Kekalainen. Those two, two key players of changing culture and creating an identity to where we are, eighth place maybe one year, 13th place another, another year, 10th place another year. So we put ourselves on the map because of those two guys being able to get 20 players on the same page. You know, and you've said that several times, culture and identity, and I love it, and we're going to put that in the show notes. Um, finally, how does Ken McCutton stay motivated? Because you've got so much passion for teaching the game. Um, how do you stay motivated? Because you've been doing it a long time. Pete, uh, I don't want it to ever end. Uh, it's been a, a, a wonderful uh, beginning. It's been a wonderful middle to life. And right now I'm, you know, 
maybe on the last chapter of my life or the back nine, as some people would say, uh, with coaching. Uh, I just don't want it to end. And uh, um, bottom line is they're, they're going to have to kick me out because um, – <laughs> I'll, I'll lie about my age if I have to, and I'll color my hair. But no, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding there, Pete. But uh, no, I, I, I think uh, uh, the passion is, is the key area. You know, what you have in your heart, what you have in your mind, and uh, the self-respect. And if you're a coach that bring, brings that, uh, you're going to get the results. And you can be in the game for an awful long time, Pete. And uh, I've been at it an awful long time and very, very blessed. And uh, uh, but blessed uh, to, to learn from so many and to thank so many for getting me to me where I am today. All right. Fantastic, Kenny. Great way to end the show. I want to thank you for being on, man. Appreciate it lots. Pete, let's do chapter two. Absolutely. You know there's going to be a chapter two because I got a feeling we're going to be in for a little, a little bit longer. Not too long, but we'll be in a little longer. Well, let's do it because I think that the crossover is terrific and you and I have always agreed on that, and we've done many, many programs like this uh, from radio to podcasts and uh, uh, to our Zoom meeting here right now. And uh, uh, let, let's educate more coaches and pass the baton the right way. Absolutely. I love the idea about bringing hockey and baseball coaches together on Zoom. Let's talk, ask questions. Folks, that's Kenny McCutton. Coach Columbus Blue Jackets. Um, thank wanna you, Pete. Th want to thank Kenny. Want to thank our producer, Brian Crock, the Lineup Media Group. Also, want to thank, obviously, our listeners. What a show, huh? I mean, we, wanna, we talk about outside the box, going to another sport, learning from another sport, and vice versa. I think there's a lot more there. Um, again, special thanks to everybody in the U.S. and around the world for listening to the show. You guys make our show continue to please spread the show. I'm Pete Calendo, your host. That's Kenny McCutton. We'll see you on the next show.